I am terrified of poor people. <laughs> I know you're laughing, and it's OK, because you are too. But in a world of growing inequality and largely developmental states, one cannot divorce themselves from the reality that how we perceive the poor is arguably the most critical social perspective we hold today. Not discounting the intersectionality of injustice, how we view the people who are plagued by the most historic plight known to humanity not only reflects how we see ourselves, but most importantly, how we view others. Now, sure, I'm not saying if you don't give five rand to the car or some sort of new tin being capable of reflecting humanity, but I am saying that the greatest barometer we have as people for our growth is how we treat the other, the one who is different, the one whose plight has nothing to do with us. This is what I call the scorn of the scourge. It's the understanding that, by and large, what the peasantry goes through is totally independent from us. Don't believe me? Listen to some of these ridiculous statements I'm sure you've either thought or have said yourself. Why are they begging? Uh, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> Why doesn't he go find a job? Because um, there aren't none in South Africa. I don't know, hey? These people are not being creative. They're not being innovative. They're not trying their best. If you think sleeping on the street and waking up every day to hail down every passing bucky on a street corner so you can do someone's garden for 40 rand is not trying your best, then I don't know what will. Which brings me to my next construct, which is something I call the piety of peasantry. Contrary to popular belief, poor people are not poor by choice. The slums are not a monastery. And unlike their comparison's sake, they're not untouchable or unreachable. Oh no, poor people like the very same things you do. They would probably like a McFlurry as well in this heat. This brings me to my third and most important construct for you to get. It's something I call the, par the paradox of pedantry. I think this is the most fascinating contradiction we have in society. The idea that whenever we discuss great social problems, we like to focus on the most minute of issues as a veneer to justify the inequality we see around us. Typical example, a government, a government official walks up to make a statement. We have to foster social cohesion. This is who we are. One nation for all citizens. One nation of equal opportunities. This is what it means to be proudly South African. The typical response, yeah, hey, but your president is spending billions on a jet. How are the two related? Please help me understand that. We cannot abnegate our personal responsibility to change the material lives of millions of people because someone else is doing something questionable in another sector of society. This would sort of be the equivalent of going to work, not doing your work tasks, because the Springboks lost the night before. <laughs> well, I know for some of you that's a reasonable correlation. And we are praying for you. We are praying for you. But I assure you, the two are not related. The devil is not in the details. The devil is in the injustice. The injustice has detail, but it's the devil nonetheless. Poverty is a great form of violence. It is the same violence that we all fear religiously. Well, in fact, it is the only violence that I fear so much to be that close to someone's armpit every morning on the car train. <laughs> but let me tone it down a little bit. And I, there's some things that I want to challenge here today, some myths about poor people I would like to debunk, if that's OK with you. Myth number one, poor people eat people. We all know this is true. If the riveting and scientifically grounded cinematic masterpiece we know as The Wrong Turn is anything to go by, you would know if you find yourself in an enclosure of poor people, the Gucci cologne would be too tempting for them not to eat you. <laughs> That's absolutely ridiculous, right? But some of us treat poor people as if they would eat us. When was the last time you shook a poor person's hand? When was the last time you asked a beggar for their name? There is nothing pious about being a peasant. 
there is nothing dignifying about lack. Myth number two, this has to be by far one of my favorite. Poor people love free things. Haven't you heard that before? Poor people are striking again. They want everything for free. You want to study for free? Bloody hell, man, study for free. Take it all. Education is a privilege anyway. How about I told you poor people don't like free things. They just like the tools to equip themselves for upward mobility in society just as much as we do. My third and most controversial, poor people cannot afford to have sex. They should leave that to us privileged people who go to good schools and get a university education. <laughs> Haven't you heard the, ridic the ridiculous statements we make? Why are poor people having children? Um, I think just like us, they fall in love. And then he sees her and says, I'd like to build a family uh, with you. And she says, yes, I would love that. They are just the same as us. They feel the same. They go through the same emotions. Poor people are allowed to have sex, damn it. <laughs> Another myth we have to dispel about poor people. Poor people know nothing, do they? I find this absolutely amazing, because in a room like this with the minds we have, some of you will find yourselves, at least on one occasion, if not more, working amongst the poor. And the greatest mistake you can make is to go in arrogantly, assuming that you know what they need. We need to involve poor people in the percolation process. And the most difficult thing about that is it requires humility from us to say, what do you need and what's most pertinent to you? The last myth, which I'd like to debunk, which is one we all believe, I believe to this day, is what I title poor people and the Siberian itch. We all know poor people house all sorts of diseases, ranging from tuberculosis to HIV and AIDS and the dreaded Siberian itch. No, that's not true. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you house certain diseases. And in a continent plagued with HIV and AIDS like Africa, the worst thing we can assume is that that disease is a poor disease. But in conclusion, I'm going to wrap it up like this. This talk is, in fact, not about poor people. This talk is about the scourge of the peasantry. This talk is about injustice and how it's intersectional. You see, in a pre-94 South Africa and a civil rights America, the question was never do black people feel equal to white people, because that's why they fought. The question was do white people feel equal to black people, and we all know what the answer was. In the same way, the question is not do women feel equal to men, because that's why schools of thoughts like feminism exist. The question is do I, as a heterosexual male, feel equal to women in society? And sadly, many of us know what that answer is. In the same way, the question is not do homosexual South Africans feel equal to us, because that's why they have gay pride. The question is do I, as a heterosexual male, feel that I'm equal to the homosexual individual. In the same way, the question is not do poor people feel equal to you and I, because that's why they strike, that's why they vote, that's why they protest. The question is, do you and I, sitting in this room, feel equal to the person begging on the street? You see, the idea that your impact and influence on the world is linear is flawed. You can change the world right where you are. And now that I've showed you the power of your privilege, I'm going to ask you, what are you going to change? And I urge you, I implore you, like the man begging you for five rand, beg for change. <laughs>